come on with a question for you. This is not about me. <laughs> my question, my question is: during times of high stress, i.e., right now, um, educators often revert to what feels safe. And um, what do you think would help communities to help to build a community of collaborative innovation during this time of high stress? It, it's so weird that that's the question you're asking. I, like in. I was I okay, and I, I'm good. You might have to repeat it in a second because I was thinking like I know it's gonna sound weird. Why are you singing ABBA? Right? You're singing ABBA when I so on as a kid. I have an older sister, and so I'm like my sister is 16 years old. You know, older than than I am. Right? She she kind of raised me for a little while, mm -hmm. and I remember growing up on ABBA, and it's funny because. Uh, I don't know if you saw Eurovision, which is probably one of my favorite movies. It is incredible. Have you seen Eurovision stuff? My seen? husband forced me to. Yes. Uh huh. I did. Oh, yeah, yeah. Ding dong. Best song ever. So I love that movie. And so it starts off with ABBA, right? Like it actually starts off with ABBA uh, winning the Eurovision. And that's actually not real footage because they didn't actually televise it at that time. Uh, but they were they were there. And I think there's something really powerful about like what we grew up with, what we know. And I think, and then you ask that question and I'm like, Oh, that's like, that was literally what I was just thinking based on what your choice was for mm -hmm. actually doing karaoke. And so when we're talking about, I, I think people need the, the idea. And this, this comes from Covey. He talks about the, the notion of confidence and competence. Right. And we've all like, 2020 is the year of the learner. Whether you like it or not, it's the year of the learner. Every every organization, every individual, you have to do this. But I think part of it too is what do we know that works and how do we adapt it in different situations, right? And what do we feel comfortable with? And I don't know if you've ever seen this, but I started using this little meme check-in, right? And the meme check-in just has like different animals, like how you feel in today, you just pick and there's like a sleeping otter, you know, like as a happy cat, that kind of thing. And I share it, you know, as people enter into a Zoom space, right? And I share this as people are entering. And I'm like, hey, you got to like tell me, like, not, don't just pick the number. Tell me why you're feeling that way and why you're connecting. And, you know, Steph pops in. She's like picking a five, which is like a, a dog with a Frisbee coming at its head. I'm like, and I'm like private messaging Steph. I'm like, are you okay? Like, what's up? Oh like, God. this is not, that's not, a, that's, that's the private message question, right? To check in on this, right? And so I actually do this. People are like laughing when they enter the room. They feel comfortable. They're, they're ready to go. And then I get in the presentation. And then I talk about, you know, why it's important to build relationships. And then I actually refer to the study from Ohio State talking about simply greeting kids uh, in the hallway at the beginning of classroom actually has been shown to prove uh, uh, reading and writing scores. Just greeting kids in the hallway before they enter your classroom, 10 to 15 minutes, right? So... The, the way I get people to look at it is like, this is a high investment strategy, right? We know this works. And if you had zero research on that strategy and you told me, I know this works, I would 100% believe you because you're telling me before people walk into your room, they already feel valued. They already feel welcome. Mm -hmm. They feel warm to that space. And you might say, well, I don't have 10, 15 minutes. Well, you might not think you do, but you're going to save 10, 15, 20, 30 minutes of classroom management trying to get kids on task, right? Mm -hmm. So the reason I'm bringing this all up in you know, response to your question is that you think about how I know that greeting kids in the hallway is a great high leverage thing that I do. So when I talk to them, I'm like, hey, so what I actually did, I said, what is the Zoom equivalent of this? Like when you enter into a virtual space, how do mm -hmm. I enter into a room? But a lot of times when you're actually going into a Zoom, it's just like a slide is up and it's like, you're at this place. And it's like, oh my God, like this is, you know, this is, you know, and then they just start talking, but you feel no connection with that person. Right. And so then I, then I talk and say, okay, what are the things that you're doing that you did in a face-to-face -face setting that you know, inside out that work really well. And let's try to figure what is it actually like, what's the equivalent in Zoom? What's the equivalent in maybe hybrid? And I think part of that too is we have to make that bridge between what we know works into these new spaces so that we feel comfortable as we're going through there and kind of like giving people those connections. But what happened to many people is like, it's all of a sudden you're going from one space to the other and hopefully you figure it out. And so it's kind of like trying to get people what they're familiar with is a really good way to kind of leverage them into those spaces. Now there's different things you can do in those spaces. So like, for example, when I do like a keynote on zoom, 
Um, I actually want people engaging and talking and having conversations while I'm talking. If I'm having key keynote in person, I don't want you talking the entire time I'm talking because it's impossible to concentrate, right? Mm -hmm. And so there's a way that I utilize that to actually connect and leverage. So I think it's trying to ensure like what are, what are, what's a high leverage thing that you're doing before? Um, and, and then what is like, how do you find, what's the space that you're working in now and what what's close to that? Like what's some type of equivalent? So that not only like that you feel more comfortable, but kids are actually walking these spaces and, and, and feeling comfortable, right? And I, I think that's, you know, hopefully that kind of answers your question, but I, I know a lot of people have been doing that, but it's kind of like, oh, this one space is so different. Yeah, it's different, but there's things that you know are important. Relationships are really important. Empowering kids is really important. It doesn't matter the space. Those things always matter. So I think it's what what what, what do we know that matters and figure fo focus on that, not just simply like the pedagogy. Mm -hmm. What do you think, Steph? Well, you, I, you tell I me your answer that, to this question. No, I find that super helpful. I'm also thinking about it, I think, from the perspective of like the collaboration of educators in the space too. And so like for me, when you were talking, I started to think about how do I apply those same things? Because I am doing them in the classroom. And how do mm -hmm. I apply them with staff? Like, are we right. opening sure. our spaces to like build our staff and, and that support in the same way that maybe if I'm talking about um, really building a community that is based on collaboration so that we can innovate, then we do have to yep. build relationships between staff where they feel safe to do so. So that all, all of those things that you're talking about as foundations that will save you time later with students, it's the same thing with staff. And so I you know, like I keep thinking about it from that perspective of like teacher leader, administrator, and also staff members. I, I hear from teachers all the time who are saying they're feeling alone and wanting to build that and not right. knowing how, right? And feeling alone in that space. Yeah. So, yeah. And, and, and I know you read Innovator's Mindset and uh, that that is one, that way, that notion that you're talking about is like, the whole, I know this, like, it seems like such a simple thing, but that meme check-in thing, right? Mm -hmm. I I do it for pe with adults so that they can see the effectiveness with of it with the, themselves and say, how do you actually, what, what does this look like for your kids? Like, what does this look like for your students? And because they experience it, but what some people might actually do is say like, hey, here's a great way to actually greet kids. You could use this meme check-in. And then they just talk about it but they don't actually emulate it. But if mm -hmm. you emulate it, and so that that's something that I've been talking about for years because one of the one of the great lies of education that drives me crazy is like parents just want school the way it was for their kids. That is not true. That is absolutely not true. Parents want what's best for their children. Mm -hmm. And if they believe that the only the only if they the only experience they know is the experience they had in school they're going to by default believe it's best because I turn out fine. Like, so why do I need anything different? So when you actually bring parents in and say like, Hey, here's something we're doing with your kids and we want you to go through it and see it. And then they walk and go, that is so much better than when I was a kid. I'm like all for this. Then you get people understanding that too. And like, Steph, I'm going to ask you a question. Have you ever said this in your teaching career? Okay. I'm going to see if I'm going to see if this translates from Canada to California. Uh, the bell doesn't dismiss you. I dismiss you. Have you ever said that? Have I've you ever heard said a version of that? I've heard it. I have not said it, but I have heard it. Yeah. Okay, but okay. So, but you, but where did you hear? It? Did you hear it when you're a student? I heard it across the hall as a teacher. Okay, so you, so another teacher. Oh, now, yeah. now, honestly, did the teacher cross the hall? And now I'm going to be the first to admit I've said this myself, right? And when I did, that meant I sucked. That was a horrible day, right? Kids are bolting for the door. Get me out of here, okay? <laughs> so the teacher across. So I'm in Canada. You're in California. The teacher across the hallway. Do you believe they made that up? Do you believe that they're like, hey, here's a really good line, right? Like, where did they get that from? They they heard it before, for sure. They heard it before yeah. from a teacher they had as a student. Yeah. And so the proof of that is that we pass practices down over and over again. And I'm not against actually using past practices. And I've really tried to um, really temper my language with the notion of traditional, not equaling bad, because some people say like, you know, we got these like really traditional teachers. I'm like, and right. Like, do you have bad teachers? Cause that's a different thing. So I tell a lot of stories to connect, you know, the stuff I'm talking about. I actually noticed one of the comments, someone said like, how did, how did he start basically with Eurovision into his answer? <laughs> Right. And like trying to make personal connections to this mm -hmm. storytelling is the oldest practice in teaching and learning. Right. 
but it's asking, okay, is this still working? Is this still something what we're doing? But also understanding that we have to change the experience of our staff. So they go, that's so much better. And like, well, I'm a huge advocate of digital portfolios, right? But I don't like that schools just dump them on kids, but they don't have never learned them themselves. So I'm like, hey, you actually got to got to go through the process. You got to create your own. You got to go to this so that you can start having those light bulb moments like, hey, this is how I use it for this and for this. But we just want to skip right to the teaching without doing the learning too often. And I think that's a, what you said um, about ex getting teachers to experience that and focusing on that. That's probably the highest leverage way that you get people to embrace change because they embrace it from actually experiencing it as opposed to being told it might work. Mm. And I think that really, really connects Stephanie to our conversation when we at the very, very start, um, the, the first episode, whenever you said, uh, greet the children where they are and um, ask them how they are. And I think that's what we have to do now at the minute. I think we want to try and skip to the teaching because we feel like we're wasting time through hybrid or through digital because we don't have that time in person. But I think, like you said, George, it's like, we gain so much time by putting the personal part in but then we can do go to the learning or the teaching part then so it's all it's, it's not an either or it's like they weave together so we can we can move forward